if you're one of those people that finds the sort of um, bashing of religion and stuff tiresome or uh, offensive, just give me five more minutes. I only read one book, but it's a good book, don't you know? I act the way I act because the good book tells me so. If I want to know how to be good, it's to the good book that I go. Because the good book is a book, and it is good, and it's a book. Well, my dear viewers, I'm going to level with you. The first 21 verses of this chapter are not even worth reading. It's a highly convoluted and confusing story of how Gideon chased around Zeba and Zamana, who, although they were kings of the Midianites, they were, say it with me now, bugger all worth mentioning up to this point. Yeah, of course, you may read the rest of the chapter if you really want to, but I'm not going to waste your time. Verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also, in a three-generation dynasty like unto North Korea, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And also notice that only the men of Israel doth make such an offer, for our women doth not have the right to vote. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you, and under no circumstances shalt thou statement be directly contradicted in the immediately following chapter. Stay tuned. And Gideon said unto them in a completely separate statement that in no way implies yet another Todd Gammed interpolation, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey, and buffalo wings, and an Xbox 360, and a copy of Diablo 3 and the complete set of the Monty Python television episodes on DVD. They had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites, which is the only reason why anyone has ever worn golden earrings for any reason at any point in human history. And they answered, We will willingly give them. Never mind that the previous chapters in this book of stupid very clearly stated that the Midianites had stolen our food and our kettle, and we are now starving to death, and all those earrings could possibly be traded with the local ethnic groups for food, crops, seeds, and kettle. No, we will just hand over these precious items so that Gideon may use them to create a religious item that directly contradicts the laws of Moses. Mm, seems legit. And they spread a garment and did cast every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand seven hundred shekels of gold, which is quite a lot. Or maybe it was nothing. I'm not quite sure what the exchange rate was. Besides ornaments and colors and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about the camel's neck. Uh, notice, of course, that Gideon never actually asked for these things, but he got a little greedy when the people gave them him of their own free will. And this practice continues even to this day. All a religious person has to do is request a love offering of a very small amount, and then very humbly accept any offers of gold and silver and cash and credit cards and luxury automobiles and mansions and private jets that their respective congregations simply give them out of the goodness of their hearts. As we all know, religiously based psychological manipulation is a very lucrative business. And Gideon made an ephod thereof, which is a religious garment that only priests are allowed to wear, and put it in a city, even in Oprah. And he put it on display in the public museum, next to a copy of the Mona Lisa made out of cheese, the world's largest collection of nose hair trimmings, a medal given to General Patton for a battle that nobody remembers, and an autographed picture of Moses. And all Israel went a whoring after it, knocking on Gideon's doors at all hours of the night, wanting special prices on admission into the museum, with discounts for students, elderly people, military members, and children under the age of 10, which same became a snare into Gideon and to his house. Bloody tourists. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the children of Israel commented in their Facebook accounts that the wrestling match was truly epic, no doubt. And the friends did demand picks, or it did not happen. And the country wasn't quiet as forty years in the days of Gideon, but the city was loud, and the people did rock and roll all night, and did party all day, and the city did look upon the country in pity. And Jerubiel, the son of Joash, who, if thou wilt remember is Gideon's other name, see previous episode, went and dwelt in his own house, for he was messy, and left empty beer cans and stale potato chips all over the damn place, and his roommates did hold a serious meeting to discuss the matter. After several hours of intense deliberations, they decided that Gideon was to be the next one to be voted off the television show. 
And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives, and they did all live together in what can only be described as a traditional marriage. And the television executives did offer him yet another television show, and while I am quite certain that Gideon must have had daughters, they were, of course, and say it with me now, bugger all worth mentioning. And his concubine that was in Shechem, for such a thing was also considered a traditional marriage, she bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech, who would become important in the next chapter. And under no circumstances can the single verse be considered an interpolation added into the text after the fact. There was absolutely no way that happened. And Gideon, the son of Joash, also called Jerubiel, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulchre of Joash his father, who apparently also died as he apparently also had a sepulchre in Oprah of the Abyssalites, or however thou sayest that. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, I mean his body wasn't even cold yet, that the children of Israel turned again and went whoring after Balaam and made Baalbereth their god. There is nothing like the death of an oppressive and ruthless dictator who plundered their wealth, poured their food down the drain, and listened to disembodied voices inside his head to make his people instantly abandoning a state-imposed religion, dance on his grave, and sing, Ding Dong, the witch is dead. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Mm, fair enough. Let's restate that quote as written. And the children of Israel remembered not Yahweh Elohim, a ruthless god of war. Since it is now peacetime, it was only natural that the people wanted to revert to the worship of Baal, a god of peace. Oh, and you can scratch out that bit about delivering out of the hands of all their enemies. Todd did nothing of the sort. Uh, the viewer knows very well that the people of Israel did all of that by themselves. Neither showed they kindness into the house of Jeruel, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness that he shewed into Israel. Uh, yes, kindness. That's what that was. He wasted food when other people were starving, stole livestock, cut down trees because, get this, the trees were evil, destroyed private property, directly discriminated against people's privately held religious beliefs, discharged vast numbers of soldiers for ridiculous reasons, only to recall them into action because he was a piss-poor excuse for a military leader. And he did this all because the voices in his head told him to do so. I guess we have all learned what the proper definition of kindness is. Just like speaking out against homophobic bullying, his definition of intolerance, and decrying the murder of an innocent woman who was accused of witchcraft is the definition of bigotry. We all need to stop oppressing the politically powerful majority religion.